What follows is free. But if you want to see the full extent of what we do and get involved, go to patreon.com slash word in your ear. Now, on with the show. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Right. Well, welcome to another Word in your attic. And we're, we're delighted to be joined by... I'm afraid I'm going to say former Chelsea and Scotland footballer, but obviously known for a a renaissance man in terms of footballers. Pat Nevin, it's delighted to see you, Pat. Terrific. And a deep honour to actually come on the show. (laughs) (laughs) A massive honour. Oh, stop it. (laughs) Where do we we find you, Pat? You're in in the borders, are you? Yeah, I'm in the Scottish borders, but, you know, it's kind of weird because yesterday I was in London. I'd been doing the... A game down there for five live, no, no, for Chelsea TV, and tomorrow I go to Brighton, uh, and it's it's every two or three days I, I go somewhere else, and it's great because I love travelling. But today Scottish borders, um, but there's a lot of moving about. Well, it's nice because we can move about now right, after no, sure. years of being nailed down. So, do they give you a diary full of you know? Do you have a, a load of matches in weeks ahead, kind of thing, or or is it pretty much um, done and hand to mouth kind of thing? Go on. David, Mark, you work for the BBC. Come on, seriously. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> you may get a week ahead if you're right. lucky. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you've no idea what's kind of going on, but it's, it's kind of okay. I, I'm kind of just open with everyone that I can work with and just say like. If I've made a promise to work, I work for you. If you come in next week and I'm promised elsewhere, then right, that, you know, right. Um, no. But it's it, it works out nice and easy. It's a kind of I've got a weird one tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, they just got text through saying, "Could I go on Football Focus?" And can I whisper it? I don't really know a lot about football, so like, <laughs> 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 so I'm always a bit wary of getting on that sort of stuff, you know. Um, but no, I'm, I might, I might kind of do it. I kind of like the technical side of it, you know. I love watching the games and that, but see all the kind of the background and the history of teams and players and all the rest. Of it, that, that, I'll do that with bands. I'll right? Yeah. You, so you yeah. do. Right. You don't necessarily know. Oh, he used to play with for, for so and so, and then play for so and so. Okay. No. Whereas you know, the bass player of so and so went on to be yeah. the guitarist. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very you know. Remember the good old fashioned rock family trees kind of thing. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Be frame. Yeah. Absolutely. So look, we traditionally start these chats by asking people if they can remember what was the music playing machinery in their home when they were a child. Can you? Um, yeah. A radiogram. <laughs> so the radio, but inside it, it had a turntable as well. Um, so, and it was, and it had a, something must have, I think it was a wooden thing that then opened up so you could play the records in it. Um, and that was kept in the front room. And um, we live in Glasgow, in East End, um, so eight of us in a, a, a three bedroom tenement. Oh, pain. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you yeah, know, unbelievably happy, et cetera. But, you know, that would be mum and dad. So that was the first one. And the quality of sound was awful. Um, early days didn't have a huge amount of rec- uh, records. This, you're talking late 60s, early 70s here. So what did your mum and yeah. dad have? Ah, great question. I remember um, the film scores, quite right. often films, so it's the big country, which oh. I actually... Yeah. It's a great, it's a great track that is it? You know, it is. I don't know if it is John Barry. I don't think it is, but it's no, it is not. It's uh, is it Ennio Morricone? I think it might be actually. It may, and it's a fabulous, you know. The, no, it's not. It's Elmer Bernstein. Sorry. Uh, okay, carry on. So brilliant, brilliant. Um, you know, intro with that. But the all stuff. My dad was a big Sinatra fan. Uh, so there was that stuff. But then I had older brothers and sisters, oh, <laughs> and yeah. there where's the joy came because. They started bringing in, you know, they were big Rod Stewart fans in the early days, you know, Gasoline Alley, You Wear It Well, you know, all the kind of original sort of Rod Stewart early stuff in faces. Um, and they were Stones fans and obviously well, Beatles, clearly, because <laughs> you could not be. Uh, so you had all that original stuff in there. So I was uh, getting that from like late 60s, early 70s when I was uh, seven, six, seven, eight years old. So that could- was what was playing. Can you remember the first single you bought? Do you know, I'm going to read this is so pretentious. <laughs> the actual first 
album I bought. I bought an album before I bought a single. Oh. And it was a double, it was a gatefold concept album. <laughs> it would have been Genesis. Lamb Lies Down in Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> How old were you at the time? Uh, well, there, I, there's, a, there's a wee con going on here, right? Because, of course, my older brothers and sisters were buying all the stuff that I'd like. So yeah. I didn't need to buy it. So the first time when I went actually went out and with my own money and bought it, you, you, I can't remember, 76, 77, something like that. A couple of years after, two or three years after the lamb was actually out. But I had other, my brothers and sisters had other Genesis albums anyway. So that was the one that we didn't have, so I went and got it. So it's a bit of a scam, that one, really. Um, but singles know that before that. I can remember, if, look, I remember very, very first time that I thought I need to buy that record and I need to get it and I need to own it. And it was a stone strike, it was a rolling stone strike. And it was, um, it was from, can you, can you remember, do you remember that hexagonal album? Uh, that the Stones had a great through the through the oh, glass, it, through the, the, the second greatest hits. I'm going to hit. it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You'll have it behind you somewhere. I do. <laughs> it's uh, through the past darkly. I think through it's the past called. darkly. Yeah. yeah, it's the second greatest hits one. Yeah, yeah. go on. And, and on that was the track Two Thousand Light Years from Home." Of course. And it just blew my mind. I just thought, wow, it doesn't sound like anything else. And for its time, it kind of didn't. You know, I suppose like when you thought of Bowie's. Um, early early stuff it kind of blew a lot of our minds um, right. but that kind of that psychedelia kind of blew mine as well right so that from that instead of going to pop and stuff like that I would then go oh no I'll, I'll go Pink Floyd and Genesis and all that so that's where I went as a very young kid right. and this was Glasgow right wasn't it yeah so was there a that. sense of kind of local pride about Alex Harvey and uh, the average white band and all those kind of Glaswegian groups. Um, God, it shows you my ignorance. Sorry, Mark. I thought average white band were Dundee. <laughs> so, they probably are, but are they? maybe they are. <laughs> I thought I, they were I, I'm probably wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't know. It was. Well, I actually only got that later because remember, I'm really young at this point. You know, I'm not yeah. even going to gigs by this point. And um, by the time I start going to gigs, you know. Maybe I think my first ever gig was was seventy seven, you know, nineteen seventy seven. First ever gig, Glasgow Apollo. And, and who was that? Um, this is one of those ones where you know, you know, your first gig can be stylish, and then becomes really unstylish, and then becomes really stylish again. Yeah, absolutely. So, come on, Thin Lizzy, Live and Dangerous. Oh, oh that's good. I'm, I'm delighted by that. Yeah, fantastic. I, I loved it, and it was the power of it. And, what Phil Winnett was like uh, that night. And it, from then, because remember 77, 78, you're getting the punk coming in. Yeah. And, and you're kind of now getting really confused, <laughs> where I was anyway. Yeah. Because I loved a lot of the new stuff that I was hearing. Um, but I didn't want to drop, drop all the other stuff that I liked. Whereas right. everyone else was dropping it all. And I thought, well, it's actually okay to like both. It's, it's fine. <laughs> So did you have long hair at the time or did you, had you taken the no, step Not happy of... long hair, just, just, right. yeah, just, uh, you know, we all had hair come down a wee bit, but uh, it, it was weird because at that point I'm then playing a bit of football yeah. as well. It must have been more than a bit of football, Pat, surely. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a lot of football. Um, by the way, you told me to bring, uh, yeah, you suggested when we chatted before we bring, uh, Stuff in show. Yeah, you go on. Oh yeah, what, come on. What, you what got? have you got? That, that's an old concert gig thing. That's All a, right. Yeah, yeah. Sort of thing. yeah. And that was the last time I ever saw them. God, I've written something in it. I can't believe how pathetic is this. I've written the gig. <laughs> I've written what they played as it went along. Oh God. Oh no, that's fair enough. <laughs> but as, as the gig's gone on. Wow. Anyway. So you sat there in the audience with a piece of exercise book paper and wrote down the carpet crawlers or whatever. I Exactly, ripples and all that sort of stuff. Um, I suspect, I can't remember doing that, but I suspect I probably noted it and then wrote it later. Yeah, um, sure, um, sure. So, but kind of Glasgow is a great place then because, as you, you well know, and most listeners will know, the, the, the gig culture in Glasgow is gigantic, you know, and so many people, I mean, wherever a band goes, they get great to be here in Nottingham yeah. or whatever, you know, or anywhere, it doesn't matter. But when they say it in Glasgow, it's kind of got this weird resonance because the it's noise true. that you often get 
is like straight in your face. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the great things about going to see gigs in Glasgow because if you played well and you reacted well, it was it was a phenomenal. I remember seeing Genesis then followed really quickly. You know, they played the Apollo. Then Lizzie were just before that, but also then Susie and the Banshees. And it was, right. <laughs> it was kind of this kind of weird kind of crossover time. And I went to see The Fall a few weeks later. And it's like, your mind's so mixed up because it was a Hex induction hour tour, I think it was. Yeah. First time I'd ever seen them. Um, and way over my head. Um, but I finally caught up, <laughs> well, a year or so later. So you've got this weird... Can I go back to the question we're asking you? The yeah. question was, if, if we can remember it, <laughs> were you proud of the band? And my first band that I was really proud of was this wee band coming through that like, like hundred, of, hundred of us would go along and watch and watch them every five or six weeks and it was called Simple Minds. Right. And, was, and nobody knew them and their early stuff was very dark European, very kind of can Bowie-esque, yeah. you know, low kind of that sort of period Bowie sort of thing. But there was a, it was a kind of really unusual modern sound. But there was also this wee proggy thing in the background. With, Jenny, with the simple minds so it was a kind of nice kind of but there was a whole bunch of us that used to go and basically follow them around and um, for, for quite a few years three or four years before they suddenly released i think it was new gold dream and then we thought oh well that'll be them going then yes. <laughs> have you told jim care this since yeah i met jim care lots what did he say well, he said it in that kind of accent he's got, you know, that kind of kind of half Glasgow, half kind of US accent. He's just one of the lads. He's just a guy. And I'd say, it. I mean, I didn't dislike them, but remember, uh, they, first, they released New Gold Dream, and I'd been following them for three, two or three, four years, whatever. Because uh, that was absolutely, probably only two or three years, because they were released my album every six months. It was mental. And they were all brilliant. And we went through to Edinburgh, me and a couple of my mates, and uh, they played this new album. And we were thinking, oh, more of the same. And at the end, of it, we all just stopped and went, well, that's them. And they're going to be absolutely gigantic. Because <laughs> you can just tell the warmth of it all. I told Jim that. And um, he, he said, you know, we had to go a different direction. And, you know, I knew, I knew Peely couldn't stand it, but I got bored with it at that point. But that's what happened with John Peely. You know, he got bored with that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, and Jim, just, he's always been really cool about it. I don't know if Charlie's as cool about it because he wants to be right in there and back being a hip, kind of hipster kind of guy. Uh, but Jim's brilliant. I, every time I've ever met, can I tell you a story about Jim? Yeah, go yeah. on. <laughs> brilliant. We, we used to, for some reason, we always used to meet in planes flying down to uh, um, London. So we're sitting next to each other on this plane from Edinburgh and uh, I was going to play in a game and it was a game of football for celebrities and ex-players and Damon Albarn was playing and lots of other so people were playing. It was like, by the way, a lot of musicians are good footballers, weirdly, yeah. right? Yeah. Best mid midfield I ever played in, like, was actually two, two two other musicians, two musicians and me, when I say, one of them being Stuart from Bell and Sebastian. Anyway, we're flying down and... Um, Jim's going, yeah, I'm going to London. I said, what are you doing? And he says, I'm, I'm going to see the ex-wives. I went, <laughs> well, plural? And he went, yeah, yeah. Like, Patsy sit, stays next to uh, Chrissy. Of course. So, so they yeah. stayed next door to each other, right? And I went, oh, that must be confusing. And he went, oh, no, it's great. Like, Chrissy's like her big sister. They're brilliant. They're great. And he says, it kills two birds with one stone. Like, he <laughs> just visit both of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, I oh, know, but look, Jim, you could come to Stamford Bridge. We've got, I've got a game so going on there and you could play, have a game. And he goes, ah, I promise you see them. This is real rock and roll, weird life, right? And I went, do you know what? You, why don't you just dump the game and come around and see Chrissy and Patsy? I mean, you and Chrissy, you're doing great. Like, you know, you know. Like, what? Are you trying to bring me with Chrissy? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Who I remember, uh, I was actually... You, I've got, I looked out my book of old uh, tickets. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, of gigs oh. that have been. I kept as many as I could over the years. And uh, yeah, Pretenders was one of the first ones as well, second album. I remember sitting in front of the Apollo looking at Chrissy going. So when, when Jim said that, I've gone all the way back to the, that 17, 16 year old boy going. <gasps> wow. uh, you would. Absolutely. Is, it, is the Glasgow Apollo the one that's got the really high stage? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, they see mad and, high. Yeah, but and which is a good idea, so that people can't go on it. You know, <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple security <laughs> procedure. Isn't exactly. it? <laughs> but it's not. I mean, I've, it's, 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 it's long, long gone. It's gone decades. Right, ago. right. Uh, uh, so it was a shame that. But I mean, Glasgow still gets on. I mean, I'm a long way from Glasgow where I live, but I'll still go to see gigs. I mean, I went to see a gig in Glasgow three nights ago, four nights ago. Yeah, right. so I'll, I'll do the four-hour round trip to go to see a gig, no problem, because it's, it's always a great place to see bands. All right. Who do you go and see a couple of you? Who did you go and see the other day? I was inter- I'm interested to see Bon Iver. Um, right, okay. Really interesting, weird place they've kind of taken it. Um, I, I can probably lean towards... Um, Fleet Fox is more yeah. her, her my kind of style uh, at the moment um, and that's a lovely thing just new bands or new-ish um, right. and it's nice when you get kids because they keep you kind of yeah. I don't often agree with my daughter and son their, their musical taste but now and again there's something it's so keep... funny though it's the length of careers nowadays you know you talk about Bonnie Iver or whatever I mean how long have they been around yeah. A long time, exactly. Way longer than bands used to be around, you know. So your children <laughs> grow up to, and they're still there. Those groups, you know, because they're still it's operating twenty five years later or whatever. Weird. I mean, there's, there's lots of. I mean, the thing is, I'm not a snob. I've never been a snob about some any sort of music at all. Well, okay, maybe for a wee while. You know, you do, you you can't spend that much time reading the NME without being slightly affected by it, um, but. The idea is not to be a snob, it's just to be completely and utterly open about it. And that's, snob's not the right word, because we all had our little clans and cliques when we were younger, didn't we? But it's a kind of, it's something you should get, kind of get over, really. <laughs> so, well, uh, I, I don't uh, see the kids having that these days, by the way. I don't see them, it's brilliant. They're just complete magpies, it's brilliant. Well, it's also it's also because they, they're listening to music without any physical format, so they've got nothing, nothing less stuff to be snobbish about. Yeah. It's just noughts and ones coming down a line, isn't it? And they either like it or they don't like it, you know. Yeah, there's so, the joy of telling people, telling kids, no, no, I'll tell you what, come and listen to it, not through that piece of technology. I'm going to put this record up, I'm going to put it through a good stereo, and what, just listen to the warmth and the depth and the stuff that you hear in this that you don't hear in yours because the bandwidth is different, yeah. you know, you're, you're missing stuff at the top and at the bottom. Um, I didn't do go through that. I'm, I'm terrible with that. Driving along in a car, it, it drives me mad because you know you know the sound and you think, oh, excuse me, where's the guitar? <laughs> you know, but Apple's stuff it, it really compresses it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. But then again, your children are probably listening to it better because they're not deaf yet. Yeah, no. whereas, <laughs> whereas the rest of us are all, you know, yeah. got. Years of gun. years of abuse. <laughs> I know. So, did, how did you fit in this enthusiasm for music? Because you're very active with what what normally that you know the footballer's path is normally so kind of all encompassing. It it takes away absolutely everything, doesn't it? During somebody's teenage years, it clearly didn't in your case. Um, actually, do you know what? It saved my life. The music because. The amount of people that go into that other life, that football life, and they are just focused on one direction. And if the pressure it puts on you um, to, I mean, I've, I've chatted before we mentioned when we met down at the BBC. I mean, I recently wrote a book about like, things that you're going through as a, a football, especially as an outsider. Now, I was very much an outsider in almost every way you could imagine. I didn't dress the same. I didn't looked the same, I, I didn't even speak the same way, but I didn't have the same interests. It didn't make me feel better than anyone. Just, I wasn't going to change. I was going to be me within it. And the, the real trick about it is when you're like that, is not to kind of bend towards the others. It's to, no, just keep being yourself. And yes, you will be seen as a slight eccentric. I, it turns out, as the years have gone by, it turns out I was the normal one and they were all the weirdos. As opposed to the other way around, <laughs> the things that I was would have said at the time, like you know, can we please stop this racism? You know, <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Everyone else is kind of saying. But it there now. must be there must be incredible pressures to conform within a football dressing room, particularly when you're young. Yeah, absolutely. There, there would have been, but um, I, I just come from a kind of strong-minded family. They're kind of when I say strong-minded. It's it's not. Um, 
viciously nasty standing on soapboxes type of family. It's just comfort and strength in your own beliefs. Um, right. How did they react to the, the kind of person who There's some amazing pictures of you in the early 80s <laughs> in your kind of, not quite new romantic, but not <laughs> far off, really. Those kind of the clothes, pixie boots, you're wearing pixie boots, you know, it's fantastic. How, what was the general feeling for the rest I, of the, the I think play? my dad kind of, well, Glasgow's a very stylish place. You know, people are, are sharp and stylish. Now, your style might be completely different from just about anyone else's. But at the time, there was people who were dressing up in, you think about the early 80s, right, when the, the big shoulder pads and, you know, the rara skits for the girls and all that sort of stuff, right? But there was those, some of us walking about with proto-goths, you know? <laughs> yeah. And kind of, I would like David Sylvian more than, you know, someone like, you know, whoever it is, you know, from Wham, you know, George from Wham, whatever. Yeah. It would just be my kind of style. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You get the odd look. You're right. They, they, they are a bit girly, some of the looks. <laughs> I'll grant you that. They look brilliant. Um, they're funny. I, can I show and tell again? Go on. Yeah, come on. I actually, I actually went and made the effort to find this. It wasn't easy. Um. All oh, right. NME. Yeah. yeah. One year yeah. Talking, talking to saxophones. December 1983. Okay. This is not yesterday. Um, but the best bit is I had to find this. I had to find this. That's 40 years ago. That's nearly 40 years ago. Oh I know. God. That's scary. Oh, can <laughs> I find it? See if I can't find this, it would be very, very depressing. So, unheard of. A footballer in the NME. Oh, wonderful. Was that was you, was it? Exactly. Wow. So, so time, where were you? Who were you interviewed by? Adrian Thrills. Oh, who you lived oh. in a flat with, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, well, after that, I did. I'd never met him before that. Um, but they, they kind of found out I, at this point I was into Joy Division and the other bands. And I probably those. read that. So what club were you with, with then? I'd just signed for Chelsea about six months before. So... Now I was I don't know if Wikipedia has this wrong, but you were signed to Chelsea for ninety two thousand pounds. Is that That's right? isn't that amazing? It can't Which, be right. Yeah, now it sounds like yeah, lunch. Yeah, yeah. Now it sounds like what they spent on lunch. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, so it, it was ninety five, right? Oh, um, but I did, I did a I did a a little thing for something I was writing recently, and I worked out. So I was fortunate; I could play the year twice at Chelsea, right? right. Uh, but I worked out all the money that I earned in five years, twice being player of the year, a couple of times being runner up. Yeah. And I did it all together, right? And and all the signing on fees and everything, etc. And it comes to two weeks' wages of a current player. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> so, and Incredible. Actually, it's and it is. And that, by the way, you can probably tell I have not a scintilla of bitterness or regret about it. It was just nice to I loved by the way, anyone listening, you got don't get it wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In football. I absolutely loved it. It was great fun playing. I just didn't have a great interest in all the other sides of it. Right. You know, which yeah. I think you should love can that. We, and that's, can we ask oh. really quickly that, that, that about the, just to, to, to briefly, the story of how you finished up working on the John Peel show? Uh, yeah, well, I, it's extraordinary. I mean, I'd I, 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 I love John like a lot of people, yeah. you know, coming through and listening to him on, at night under covers, all the, all the usual stuff. Many thousands of us were doing, or tens of thousands of us were doing listening to the show. And they went to Chelsea, and then they asked me to write for their, uh, you know, their um, newspaper. There's a newspaper, Chelsea Football Club newspaper. Yeah, yeah. And I said I want to do a music column. And after a few months of the music column, I thought, yeah, well, why don't I try and interview John Peel? Because he music football. And by the way, saw that I just went to meet him. I just went to say hello, <laughs> and uh, I wrote to him. And he, he wrote back a couple of days because he used to write to people in those days, didn't he? It was yeah. really nice. Yeah, yeah. And he wrote back and said, uh, I'm really busy. I've not got much time just now doing my show. But I hadn't mentioned that I would play football. And then to my utter embarrassment, to my dying day, I wrote back again and said, oh, I would rather do it sooner rather than later, John, because my team, who I play for, Chelsea, are playing your team, Liverpool, in a few weeks' time. And I was wanting to do this as part of the build-up. So he hadn't realised. He, he, hadn't, he hadn't clicked. He didn't well, look didn't at your know. name. Well, then why would he, I suppose? You know, well, yeah. Why would he? I didn't say anything about it. I yeah, just, yeah, I yeah. Just, I from not. a small West London newspaper. Yeah. And he, he just phoned me up a couple of days later when he got a letter and he goes, oh, don't be stupid. Of course, come on. Yeah. And, then, and we met and we just got on really right. well. Just got on. And I think the reason being, in retrospect, a number of reasons, you'll have known John, you know, 
who joins shyness and stuff like that was I can I found quite disarming. Um, but I think we were just very much two strange outsiders in the world that we lived in. And you, even for radio and you know music radio yourselves, you'd know that that he was quite an outsider, wasn't he? Oh, he didn't yeah. really fit yeah. in with Radio One. Uh, anyway, it didn't fit at all with Radio One. It get well, except, except that ended up being the most secure position you could ever have at Radio One. Is be <laughs> the outsider over there. Yeah. You're the one guy they can't interfere with. Everybody yeah, else kind of go out of fashion. That's you right. never go out of fashion. <laughs> yeah. they, they're going to always point to you and say, look, we do this. Yeah, it's a uh, service. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, so, it, it, so it was great. A, getting to meet him first and then just getting to know him and then end up going on in the shows. Nobody never mentioned the fact that I'm on. He would sometimes say, "Oh, the famous footballs in tonight," but never say who it was. Never say who it was. Uh, yeah. And it was, uh, and I loved that whole concept of it. So, um, you know, in that way, you know, I might be scoring a diving header against Arsenal for Chelsea to to win two one, and that was quite nice. But it didn't meet didn't beat me and Peely and going on the show. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, so you're in, you're in a position to tell us. I mean, you you've scored goals, at the, you know, at a high level. And um, and that's a thrill most of us can't possibly imagine. Yeah. How does that match up with your? You must have been on stage with bands or at the side of stage or whatever. And uh, have you ever thought, oh, that's better than scoring a goal for Chelsea? Or? That's a brilliant question. That's absolutely brilliant. And I have actually thought about it. And I'll be honest with you, I've done show and tell my one time ever oh. on stage singing with a band. Oh, right. who's that? Who's it with? Uh, oh, it's a hard one. I'll give you a moment to guess. The guy in the, the far side, that's me sing, singing, obviously, near the far side. Yeah. Ooh, that's a trick. I, say, you, I can't you, get that. Oh, no. Go on, who is it? Uh, the Blue Bells. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so, Bobby Bluebell, and it, yeah. it, 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 they asked me to sing um, with them one night in Glasgow, and I went up and sang, and I I, I, and it went down an absolute storm. Uh, and it was a version of a new Scottish band at the time who had just come out called The Proclaimers, who nobody knew, right? And they had this, a song called Letter from America. Which, oh, right. Again, they'd just come out. But we reworked the words to basically wind up Glasgow Rangers fans. So I, I think the opening line was, when you go, will you send back soonest to Sampdoria? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and I, I can remember some of them to this day when you take a look at the throwbacks, two million and their crap. So, <laughs> <laughs> and we sang it. And of course, because it was done with humour and it was it went down a storm. And you, that's the moment you're talking about, isn't it? And you've just seen that audience really going for it and loving it. And I'd just come on for the encore and we went off after it. And I thought, that's exactly the same. That's it, creating or scoring a goal. That it's more creating, uh, oddly enough, uh, which I like as much as scoring, um, because you've done something that's lifted other people. It's a absolutely. brilliant, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not. I didn't find it egotistical. I just found it sharing. I love that. But the funny thing is, we went back in the green room, and uh, the lads turned around to me and went, "They went mental out there. Let, let's do it again. Come on, let's do it again." I went, "No, yeah, it can't get better. Just leave it." Just leave it. I think you're very wise. <laughs> and it was, very, but the, 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 the interesting thing about the footballer rock star parallel is a footballer has to stop doing that when they're about 35 and retire. Rock stars don't have to. They do the rest of their lives. Which is why they're addicted to it and they're still doing it in their 70s and 80s. Because I, I would argue against that that no football game's ever this, really the same as last one. You're not singing the same songs. You're not... No. You know, like if you go on a tour and you go around the world and you do play some sort of the same set for like 100 days, it, it can't... It doesn't matter what you say. It can't be that much of us every single time. Well, I don't know. Keith Richards says there's absolutely nothing to replace the the feeling of going out in front of 85,000 people and playing the opening chord to Honky Tonk Women or whatever. And I'm sure that's something you just can't live without eventually. Well... I think he tried to replace it with one or two things. Yeah, he, yeah, did. he, he did. did. He did. He yeah. did. So what, what, what are you listening to now? 
Matt, as we, uh, as as they all say in the music business, what are we listening to now? Yeah. Well, it, I've had a weird couple of years, two or three years, because it, I just started a lot more writing. You know, I had that book. I've just finished another one, um, and I ended up not really um, listening as much. I put stuff on in the background, kind of a lot of classical stuff, oddly enough, in the background. But I've actually had a couple of years sort of off. I mean, I'm, yeah. I've been sitting so concentrated and then i found that i was listening to the music and it was um I mean, what, what was what was it? it was a wee while back i was listening to a band that I'd, some friend had said oh, i should try them a couple of years ago a year ago whatever and i couldn't write because i thought they're great and it was ruining it and i thought to myself as soon as i hear something good i can't concentrate so this band was wet leg right and right. I'd, I'd never heard this they were quite the great chaise long yeah, yeah exactly fantastic and, and of course you can't not then go and look up the videos and of course they're mad i mean you know what it's like as soon as you start looking on youtube and the videos three hours later you went i was supposed to be writing here yeah yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. kind of had to put it to the side for a wee while um and it's it is a weird thing because i'm i'm not chasing stuff if new stuff you always want more than anything i always want um but i'm okay finding classic stuff that you know, without like, a, can we? Can, do you know recently the? I was going to ask you a question. How ridiculous! See the recent Beatles stuff that's been going on. Do you know the the big long the show that lasted for many twelve hours? Was it? Of the oh, get back, get back movie. Get back. Yeah. I mean, one of the best things I've ever seen. I've, I've honestly thought you're there with them. You know the personalities now. I mean, you two may have. I'm sure you have met them. <laughs> a number of the lads. But to actually be there as an outsider, I thought it was one of the most extraordinary things. And then for Paul then to do Glastonbury and wipe the floor with just about any band that's played there for God knows how. Yeah, it's was. very moving that because I kind of thought, will we ever see that again? Yeah. You know, will he ever do anything more extravagant than that? You know, if he does it in two years' time, he'll be 82. You know, it, it, it seemed like a, a, a major moment to me. I, I, I thought it was, I mean, because it's Paul, and people think, yeah, it's Paul. It's not Paul. He needs next tunes. No, no, that is magical and it's historic and it was startling and beautiful. And I would have, as a kid, I'd have probably liked John more, obviously. And my younger brother was a total Beatles fanatic, so it's basically in there, <laughs> everything's in there from a kid. And he never even thought of himself as a Beatles fan. You know, if I went back, I'd have thought, oh, I wish I could see Bill Underground more than the Beatles. But then as you get older and then you see it all and you hear it all and you realise that, see that stuff that was implanted in there? Yeah. Somebody had to write it first. <laughs> yeah. It was quite good. It was unbelievable yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, so I thought it was quite moving. Hey, can I, again, we have to win up to things, right? Last gig I went to see. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you, because I've always owned up to it. It's, it's not stylish, trendy, hip, anything, right? I wanted to find out what that ABBA avatar thing was like. Oh, right. Okay, oh, my back. gosh. What Man. was it like? Was he good? Oh, my God. Unbelievable. I cannot believe it. Um, Convincing? In a, in a worrying, upsetting way. Um, you don't need the band anymore. <laughs> oh. So it works. Horribly. Is this going to be the future? <laughs> yeah. Oh, 100%. I mean, look, so the hundred absolute hundred percent. I didn't know we were there yet with the, the tech. You know, if you listen to somebody like Mark Kimmode talking when he's talking about movies, and it's it, when you're talking about three D stuff, you're talking about the lack of heft, and you know what he means by that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You kind of kind of see that they're more yeah. that. Yeah. No, it's all there. There's a great moment. I get. See if you're going to go and see it. Switch off for twenty seconds, right? We tell a story about this. At one point, they're there, and your, your mind just shuts off after a, a song. Basically, they're there, right? And by the way, it's a, it's a small little theater. It's quite intimate, weirdly. And um, there was three girls come on and sing it in front, and you have no idea if they're real or not. All right. Is this live or not? You can't tell, because these three girls walk on, and you think, oh, that'll be another hologram. And then you, and then you think, what is it? I don't know. And and it's really weird. So So the Abba um, holograms are that convincing. Well yeah, because I didn't know the difference. Turns out they were real. And I couldn't tell the difference between them and the holograms. 
Incredible. I, I tell and, you, when I when I watch sometimes when I watch football, if you watch football on Sky or whatever, the, the kind of HD cameras and so forth, I often think this is meeting compute computer games coming the other way. You know, you can't tell whether you're watching Ronaldo as a, as an you know animated image or or the real thing. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, this is worrying for music. I mean, football will be fine. Football's on the up. It's uh, globe taking over the globe, right? So I, I never worry about football, and I use it used to, quite often. Used to use the tech and football to to build things myself. And it's another one of my jobs. Um, but the music thing is interesting because see, when you look uh, at someone who's like yourself fanatical gig goer, right? I did not want to be convinced. I'll be honest yeah. with you. You yeah. had to work hard with me because I did not want to be convinced because I went to see the band, and I remember thinking halfway through the gig. Um, if you're the Rolling Stones, do you really want to go around a hundred countries, or do you really just want to? I don't know if they're quite there yet with the technology to be able to fire it around the world. Do you not just? But then they did do an Elvis thing when Elvis was alive, didn't they? They, they did the first. Album but they did. They did a kind of cheap thing with Elvis, yeah. didn't but they? But you really? think about it now with the technology we have. You, as the Rolling Stones or whoever you are, could walk on stage, right? Any, anywhere in the world, could be Wembley, could be real, could be anywhere, and play for two hours, right? And the fans go well, right? We are now nearly at the stage where if you can you can walk on and you could probably be in every stage in every big city in the world at the same time, and nobody knows what the real ones are. You're playing live. Would it work for rock music? It obviously might work for pop music, but is rock music a different experience? Is that a yeah, real physical think, thing? One of the things is the, the interaction with the audiences. Is, that's going to be tricky you know obviously that's difficult because you can only uh, do what's in front of you but you know when people are talking about saving the planet and people flying around uh, oh, yeah. I, I, do, I don't want it to happen look guys I'm, I'm not in that team I'm on team let's see the band right? yeah <laughs> I really want I am seriously in team see the band uh, but you know I just looking at thinking do you know what uh, one of my great, uh, greatest regrets was uh, uh, two two people I didn't get to see. I had tickets to see Bob Marley. There was uh, a game on that night and I couldn't go. And he died before I got to see him again. And uh, I never got to see Prince. Uh, I think I might. Yeah. I there was a lovely story somewhere I read about you getting out of a Chelsea game because you wanted to go and see the Cocteau Twins at the Festival Hall. Was that Absolutely right? True. Absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, did you, how did you get, uh, get taken off? Uh, I, I demand demand is the wrong word. I was signing a new contract the day before, and just before I was about to sign, I said, I want something else in the contract. And the manager's like, oh, God, what is it now? And I'm not a breadhead in any way, as you can yeah. tell. And uh, I just said, I, I want to come off at half time in tomorrow night's game. <laughs> Why? Well, I was like, I go see the cocktails are playing this. This game's at Brentford. No. To be fair, it was an end of season friendly, right? right. Yeah, I loved playing, uh, but there was this, and the manager and the chairman, this guy, young Ken, Ken Bates, looked at me as if to say, "We don't get you, mate. We just don't get Ken you." Ken Bates, <laughs> that is pretty Bates, pretty Mark, unconventional. That takes you back. It does. <laughs> Goodness me! I mean, saying that to anyone, but you're listening to me now, David, and you're thinking. Saying that to Ken Bates. Ken Bates. <laughs> I can just imagine. I want to go and see the Cocteau Twins, sir. <laughs> well, I'm going to see the Cocteau Twins. <laughs> we had a really interesting relationship. Actually, I did write a lot about that. Um, he kind of weirdly respected me because I kept on standing up to him. Oh, God. <laughs> when he didn't expect it. There was a couple of set piece things that certainly in the first book were you know, a contract negotiation with this wee Scottish guy. Uh, and I'd studied, I'd done it. I've done BA commerce and stuff like that beforehand, so I kind of felt confident in that. But this wee 19 year old Scottish guy trying to be um, stressed and pressured by this very famous big Bruce, very bearded, yeah, yeah, very yeah, 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 yeah. Right. businessman. And I'm like, having none of it, I'm just going, nah. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, that's, that's the reason why I kind of, I kind of like talking about the, the two things of football and the music stroke, music stroke arts. Uh, is the fact that they did they did come up against each other now, now and again. And that's where people go, it must have been terrible. And my attitude is like, one of the first questions you asked, David, wasn't that really hard, wasn't that pressured or stressful or difficult? No, I loved that. 
Because right. sparks flew when that happened. And, and you know, I, I could tell you stories for an hour and a half about the, the things that happened when these weird people came together. And there's another story about, you know, hanging about with Morrissey. <laughs> Yeah, you went to Morris's house at one stage with yeah. Vinnie Riley, was it? Yeah, Vinnie was a great friend. If anyone who out there who doesn't know Vinnie is, I, I do think, one of the geniuses of music for the last half a century. Uh, his band, Jurette Com. Vinnie and I became just friends. I loved his music anyway, um, and still do. But he kind of co-written one of Morris's second album, I think. And uh, anyway, we went around and spent an evening in Morris's house, and it was just priceless from start to finish. I mean, I, I, I can almost devote about half a chapter to this story. But in actual fact, I could have gone on. But Describe anything been. unusual in the house. In my fit, well, look, I could go in many, many things, but there was the beautiful moment where uh, Vinnie, who's a classically, classically trained pianist and a classically trained guitarist, um, and I said to Mo, uh, Moz, can you show us around your house as you do in Glasgow? And he's went, you know, I can't be doing that. No, I should have run your house, mate. Come on. And he kind of, and eventually he did. Uh, but the, I'll not bore you with all the rooms, but the room at the top. And uh, we walked in, and there's a baby grand piano. And baby grand piano sitting there. And Vinny goes, I didn't know you played. Um, and he said, and I'm honest, in the brilliant brown get through away. I mean, no, I don't. But I thought it would be rather lovely if you played for us tonight, so I bought it for this evening. <laughs> <laughs> now, whether that was bullshit and he just rented one or it was there anyways, a piece of furniture, I don't know, but I loved that. I thought that was a great line. Oh, so Vinny yeah. there, I'm sitting on the edge of piano, so is Mick Morrissey, and there's Vinny playing this beautiful music. So I love the, the kind of strange bits of where you've got unusual places and unusual things that you've got to... Um, Big Oscar Wilde book collection. Yeah, that down in the basement. That was again. I would, if I'd have nicked in out of the house, it would have been one of his first editions of Wilde that he had down there. And there was a another room which had a weights room in it, which shocked us all. But now we know. We look at Moz now, and he's yeah. he's later. But back in those days, think about it with the gladioli and the open shirt and the kind of bay kind of look. Is the last person yeah. in the world you thought would have a big weight. I suppose, I suppose that's a great truth about the changing of the world in the last 40 years, isn't it? Nowadays, both footballers and musicians have more, have weight rooms, don't they? Yeah. Because, you know, fitness yeah. is such a hugely important part of it, isn't it? I, I, I wish I could have went up to have... Actually, I do. I do. <laughs> I do have a weight room. I have a wee room there that's got a couple of weights in it. But, uh, they're good for you. It's good for you. Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'd sell you in that one. They're, <laughs> especially when you're a wee bit older um, yeah can help your cardiovascular and that so yeah yeah, yeah a bit serious. so look so you, you you've written the, the book the, the accidental footballer which that was what a couple of years a year ago or so ago but you've got another one coming out or you're working on now yeah uh, and when's, when's that appearing uh, it's, uh, I'll be June before that so um, but it's it's kind of funny because it, it kind of changes I, again I'm an outsider in a very strange world because yeah, it's the second half of my career in football, but it goes very differently. And at one point, for four years, I do a job as uh, chief executive and player right, for yeah, Motherwell. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, see when you start, just get start get, trying to get your head round. So, so I'm chief executive, so I get the manager, I bring him in, but I'm a player, I'm below him as well. So I can sack him, but he can drop me. Yeah, yeah. And that's just one relationship with her. Uh, but it was it was an extraordinary time. Um, and this, the, the, the stories from it for this one, are, are, they were so good to write. And there was so much fun to write, um, purely because it was not like anyone else. The guy who bought the club and asked me to run it for him, I don't know if he'd ever been to a game of football before. <laughs> so... And it, 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 then it gets, then you get weird. And it, it, was it Hunter S. Thompson when the, the going gets tough, the tough get weird? Yeah. Um, and I kind of, kind of like that. It got very, very weird. So, uh, so I'm loving the writing. The writing's great. And it's maybe that gets back to the the questions you both of you were asking before about, you know, being a rock musician or being a footballer. For me, it's actually always been around one word. It's creativity. I, I love. Creation. I mean, you both 
have written extensively in books, you've both broadcast. See that lovely moment when you write something or you say a phrase or you put something out there. Now, for a musician, it might be a song, it might be a piece of singing. For football, it might be a beautiful creativity. But it doesn't matter where it is, does it? There's a wee, st- wee spine tingly moment when you write something, you go, actually, no one's written that before. And that's actually not bad. Mm. I, 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 yeah, I, love I always assume I've copied it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I've had that for exp- uh, experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You all are, you people who are journalists and have written so many millions of words and written stuff, and you always say, oh, no, I don't do that. But you know it. You must know it. You're not a writer well, unless you know that feeling. Well, uh, I don't know. Sometimes you, you write a bit and think, oh, it's quite good. And they think, yeah. I must have pinched that from somewhere else. <laughs> hey, it's the same feeling the musicians have when they yes, write here. I yesterday. must have stolen that yeah. from somewhere else. I, I can't have just invented it, which is probably true. I love the so, way your chapter titles were all uh, nearly all, all song, t- uh, song titles. They all, all are. Yeah, Story yeah. of the Blues. They all are, aren't they? The Big Mouth Strikes again. I don't want to go to Chelsea. I, 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 are you going to do that again? Yes, 100%. Yeah. I had to just change one the other day. Um, because he got, um, I sent it, I wrote it ages ago, and I'm just twiddling with, fiddling with it at the moment, and I'm getting the pictures, and I'm just tidying up, and then just adding the flourishes kind of thing, you know, because it's like painting, isn't it, when you write something? You do it, and you get the structure, and then you, you get the bits that really stand out, and you make them as good as possible. So I loved that creative side of it, right? But there was one, one and I, I went up to, there was one, um, chapter that are called apocalypse and i think is that, that's it there apocalypse that's the all yeah, right so um <laughs> editor wrote back slightly depressing don't you think <laughs> oh. yeah fair enough actually <laughs> so, so i had to kind of change that. <laughs> Classic sub-editor comment. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So look, we, we traditionally climax these conversations by asking people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made? And I feel that you, Pat Nevin, will have the answer to that question. Because oh. we've been on request for years to find yeah, out. Yeah, we're always keen to learn. Uh, I, what I, is I it? have learned the lesson. I definitely have learned the lesson. It, it's actually not, there is no best. There is no greatest because it absolutely depends what your tastes are. So, you could ask me at one part of my life and it'll be a blues record. You know, it'll be a Muddy Waters, it'll be, you could ask me at another point and it'll be a classic. But if we had to ask you today to, you to, me to today, pick one I tend record. To go by, I mean, I'm, the stuff that's behind me just now, right. you can see heroes I deeply, yeah. deeply yeah. love. Right above that is My Bloody Valentine's Loveless, which right. I think is one of the great albums. But I'll, I'll be honest, I'll, the, the second side of Joy Division is closer. Um, All right. I would say, and in that, if that had been written by any great um, classical operatic genius from any century, it would still hold up. Uh, and I think it's that that music is that good. It's it's not actually pop or rock or anything. It's actually something else completely. So if I had to stick with it, I would, I would just be that side of the album. That which, which gives me another side of some of the others. <laughs> no, the, the whole album is so, fantastic. It, it, what a wonderful nostalgic thought that is. The, 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 from, the once was the second side of something. There's no longer the second <laughs> yeah. side of anything, isn't it? You think it's, I've got another side to come, which I haven't heard. It's it's just, yeah, yeah. And it's lovely. I, I still get sent stuff, um, you know, but in bands that I like, I'm, I'm a big fan and a friend of Camera Obscura's and uh, they still they send me the vinyl and it, it's great it's fabulous because you can actually wait and turn over the second uh, side. turning it over like, turning it over turning it over where wanting to do it is is a wonderful feeling can I, I, can I tell you a, a story that's going to make you cross your legs now right <laughs> it's going to yeah. hurt you physically right behind me there you can see the uh, that's where I kept my, all my records in there, behind these kind of uh, cupboards, right? And so, like, just behind you, David, you've got all those albums yeah. covered like that, right? So I went away one, one day, and it was a sad day. I'd lost a friend, uh, and, and lost him young, and it was a shame, in, in an accident, and went to the journal. And uh, I came back, and when I came back, there'd been a flood. I'm in the basement here. And all the stuff on the bottom every single album oh a heartbreak. Flooded, right but that's the weird thing 
there wasn't absolutely no effect on me because it happened the day when I came back from losing my friend Danny. Yeah. And so it's not important. I've got a music. No, that's and that's, true. And the reason why I tell you that is because what you're talking about turning a record over, it's the music in the end. For me, it's still the music. You know, so I, yeah. so I lost a lot of those with those albums, you know, and I lost a lot of the vinyl. I've not lost them, I kept them. <laughs> Squeeze them together and see if they ever straighten up again. <laughs> but um, it's actually the music. So, yeah. I, and I've tried to replace as many as them. Or the ones certainly I wanted to replace as well. But it does kind of make you feel, oh my God. I can see you thinking, David, just now, getting that lot off the bottom shelf. And getting... <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I, I'm on the top floor here, don't worry. There's a... <laughs> No flood's going to come up here. Might be something else, but, uh, you know, no flood. Bob Harris lost a load of stuff in a flood, didn't he, in, in Oxfordshire, because uh, he on on floodplain, and uh, and he had a, a garage full of kind of Mark Boland acetates. Yeah, from, really valuable stuff. Really <laughs> yeah, valuable it stuff. I know. And it, it just... It Signed just, Bowie album. Oh, yeah, oh, really, yeah. Oh, really, oh, really oh. was, genuinely. Anyway. Well, that, that's my lucky thing. My stuff that I, it was a value, I actually happened to put it up high. The really valuable things like, you know, stuff that had signed by bands that, you know, that were, when they were small, now they're... Right. They, that stuff's there. And it's not there for value. It's just, it was special. You know, so I kept that. Yeah. Value. So it was all right with that sort of stuff. So it's, well, look, Pat, it's been lovely to talk to you. Fantastic. Uh, um, thank you very much for your time. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.